Welcome back, fellow armchair generals. This is Gamer1745 here with my continuing playthrough of Hearts of Iron 3 with Black Ice 9. Of course, you're playing Mussolini's War, and in this war, he's doing really well, as you can see. So, we're going to continue this. Oh, and if you're new to the channel, or just haven't yet, please subscribe to the channel. I'd love to see you around more often, so please do. We just took Vichy. That's Vichy. What is Vichy without water? Oh, in this battle here, I noticed the coup were fighting. Montgomery. This is a British division that they temporarily put under British command. That's actually sort of more more than just technically what was happening with um, the BEF. An overall strategy, they were under um, French command now. Sort of local tac locally, tactically, they were under British control, of course, but... Um, We're going to pound our way through to Algiers. Yep, you're taking the north up here. Keep spreading your forces out, because we're sort of concentrated. We'll come in and take that harbor for me. That's what I wanted to do, is take that harbor to put you in a similar position that we're in here. Oh, you want to be bombing there. If you can bomb got this thing to fight through, but I don't think it's nearly as heavily fortified as. did take Toulouse. How oh, is Bordeaux this time of year? Do the Italians really want to go to Bordeaux? I don't know. They're being supplied, so they have supplies. Doesn't mean they're going to win or survive, but and if that's my only serious loss outside of anything in Ethiopia, I'm going to be relatively pleased. Um, what isn't attacking? They're all attacking. Good. That's what I wanted to see. Oh, we've got... Um, no, thank you. more research possibilities. Naval strike. Oh, they're down to two battleships and a liner, so we hurting them. Take out that liner, I think the troops drowned. Okay, well, if you can attack me, we'll do better in defense than we do when we're attacking you. Things get bad enough, I'll retreat into the mountains. Both 
occupy this province before so that they'd all get taken out. Now let's concentrate our efforts instead of spreading them out. Don't know if we'll make we're leaving that. Okay, well good. Now that we're there. Um, let's go here. Ah, oh, French armor. Um, well, they're heading towards Paris. There's Von Thoma. Sap Dietrich's there. And some Panzer divisions there. Coming there, so they've got Calais. They're coming towards Pologne. They'll get across the river. Well, they've already crossed here, so they'll keep coming. Oh, Hungary. We also have some Hungarian troops. Okay, Atalo, Bal Atalo Balbo has died. On the night of the 28th of June, Atalo Balbo um, aboard a S-79 um, transport type plane, I believe, or bomber or something, he, you know, was, it wasn't, uh, I think it was like a transport um, type thing. Uh, it wasn't, and that's sort of the point to some degree was shot down by friendly AA fire of the light cruiser of San uh, Girigino, uh, sorry, while landing in Tobruk. Officially, he was mistaken for an English bomber because of the same time Tobruk was being bombed by English forces. Unfortunately, many said Mussolini ordered the murder because Balbo harshly criticized Mussolini's alliance with Hitler. The day after his death, a British plane dropped a message on Italian lines stating that the British forces expressed their grief for the death of the Marshal of Air, Abtal Babo, a great leader and a valiant aviator. Yeah, this is interesting. Um, I don't know what to make of that. I've heard um, that type of thing for quite some time. Um... How do I put this? You've got a aircraft coming in. It, then, you know, somebody has, you know, the marshal of the air. You know, it's um, sort of Goering's place. I mean, Goering, uh, and he was also pr pr pretty, you know, you know, um, commander of Libya and whatever. So it's, it's almost like Goering. In the sense, popular as a uh, as a politician, because you got to remember, Goering was a really popular political leader. Um, becomes um, what is it, Speaker of the Reichstag? Well, you know, before even Hitler's comes to power. You know, so he has, you know, so Goering has a lot of political power in Germany, in Nazi Germany, and I say both that because, hey, if he had had a dispute with Hitler or something. You know, and decided to leave the Nazis, you know, to form his own party. It wouldn't have done, wouldn't have been a good move in, in a tactical sense because it would have split the Nazis. Probably a lot of them would have stayed with Hitler, um, especially since Goering wasn't the type to be allied likely with, um, well, maybe he would have been, I don't know, um, with, uh, I was going to say, Ernst Rome during the, the rise there. But Goering was a bit of a pusher, um, in the sense that you know a climber would be a, like the British, you know, pushing himself forward. He really sort of aggressively pushed for um, status and whatnot as part of, you know, in the World War One era, because he's from Berlin. I think basically a sort of a middle class background, 
when the German army, and including the Air Force or whatever it was called at the time, I don't know if it was an independent branch or just part of the, you know, the air arm of the army or whatever, whatever was still very aristocratic. And here's this sort of upstart, if you will. At least that's from watching some movies and things about Goering early on. That's the impression I get. Now, that could be just post-war, um, you know, uh, people wanting to um, diminish Goering's character, but I don't think so. Um, so, you know, Goering had a his own his own popularity. He was a real popular, especially with, you know, the, the masses, if you will, because you normally don't get that sort of personality elements transmitted out because he was made into a war hero because uh, I don't know if directly after, but he, you know, if you don't know this, Goering takes over the Flying Circus. That's the, the sort of squadron or squadron group that um, the Red Baron um, von Richthofen commanded after he shot down. There may have been an intermediate, you know, commander in between there. I'm not sure, but Goering takes over. So this is the sort of premier, cool, leading, best, whatever, German um, fighter squadron at a time when lots of Germans are just young German men are trained just you know they've got five hours ten hours or less training t flying time total put up into because you know once you got the engines going it's pretty easy to knock out a World War One aircraft because it's wood frame cloth and some wires mostly so it's not huge industrial time so Germany's putting up a lot of these um, fighters that are okay models uh, you know, compared to the Allies, but the Allies are just shooting them down like, like crazy because the Allies are just sort of winning the air war. And they have just, you know, there's, you can look at some of the, the post, you know, inter, early interwar, um, well, 30s, because I'm thinking mostly um, sound, so 1930 and on, stuff about some of the World War I um, flying stuff, and there was a lot of losses on the Allies' side as well, but supposedly that in the final days the germans are just being shot down like crazy because they just don't have experience combat people they got people that can you know take off land and fly around a bit but they're not like trained fighter pilots well um through this period my understanding the the flying circus maintains its um high status and you know kill rates and but that's just one sort of squadron or group or whatever out of the you know the effective german air force there and so Goering leads it through this sort of to the end of the war. So he's a real popular political figure in Germany. Well, Balbo is, is something akin to that. Um, I don't know if he ever, I just don't know if he's ever, you know, held a, um, a parliamentary seat under the fascists very well may have. But he, he, you know, he was actually fairly popular in America. Balbo was, um, you know... Early in the fascist regime, he had toured around America, if I remember correctly, and doing a lot of stuff in, involving the like um, sea boat or seaplane races, and you know, hosting them and other things. So he's sort of a you know a um, and like I say, for a while he was you know in charge of you know the Italian Cyrenaica um, Libyan colony situation here. And so he has political as well as um, military responsibilities and, um, you know, um, power. Excuse me. So he could be a, a threat to um, Mussolini, especially in the sense that if he hadn't died, what would have happened instead of, you know... Um, waiting until the allies you know had landed you know down in this part of italy and then arresting mussolini and um surrendering maybe the fascists and the royalists and others you know once north africa was lost before the germans had sent large numbers of divisions down in into italy maybe they could have put babo in charge of it and babo um really you know is able to leave the the war. You know, I, as you know, I I've contended that um, if you've watched enough enough of my series, that if Italy had stayed neutral in World War Two and they hadn't pushed Yugoslavia into any position in World War Two, you would have had much of the southern front. You would have had no sort of Mediterranean front going on here. You would have had you know Vichy down here that yeah you could land, but so 
So you've got a sort of garrison it there, but you still would have the Italian Navy sailing around out here that could jump into the war at any moment, you know, if if major action starts happening. And also one of the things I've often thought was that Italy could be trading with the rest of the world, sort of like Spain was, but more so, you know, with Latin America, um, there's lots of resources here, um, and also possibly countries like Iran, um, Japan, um, but you know, as, as neutral Italy coming in, bringing in resources and then quietly reselling them for a profit to Germany. So it would be fuel, um, other rare materials um, coming into Germany via Italy, and Italy probably, well, definitely in the time period um, of Britain and France, they wouldn't want to add Italy to the war, you know, even even while France was still alive and thought to be doing well. Um, they wouldn't want to add another front to the war, and definitely once Britain's in it, Britain doesn't, wouldn't even, you know, um, I, I sort of contend, not the that I've often used um, seaplanes basing out of Italy to strike at um, Royal Navy down here, but um, they probably wouldn't have put up with that. But they would have put up, I think, with um, secret German um, basing of submarines in the Mediterranean. You know, it'd have to be sort of kept sort of secret. Now, of course, submarine sinking stuff um, probably would get out, and everybody would realize that um, oh, we have an out carrier there. Um, everybody would realize that the Italians are supporting them, but is it, you know, that you've got to escort closely and, and run convoys through the Mediterranean, is that, you know, maintaining that, or do you add Italy to the war? I think they would have put up with some German um, submarines sinking a few, you know, or operating in the Mediterranean. They'd just try to hunt them down and sink them, and, and as well as escorting. Um, so... I've thought that that would have been a much smarter strategy for Germany. Now, of course, we're playing Mussolini's war. Mussolini had other other agendas going on, but had be, again before there were. Now, once you have allies moving in and occupying um, Italy, and Italy surrenders, gets some sort of because they become and I don't know the details of it co-belligerent. So they're not part of the Allies, but they're also at war with Germany. They're co-belligerents with Germany. So the Italian Royal Army, now they don't do much fighting. Um, you know, they sort of um, quickly purge much of the fascists from the, ar from the armed forces that the Royalists control, if you will. Um, I think mostly locking them up or whatever. Now, you know, not, not harshly. It's just trying to keep them from you know, that they are ideologically aligned with Germany and don't like the situation and don't want them to sabotage it. As well as they don't want them coming up later on as the Italian Social Republic is formed. Don't want them uh, up here. So, just, you know, detaining them. Not so much as traitors. I mean, it's... Eventually, of course, you get into the... with the um, uh, sort of guerrilla, the communist and the other leftist elements. And maybe not so leftist guerrilla type movements against the Germans that becomes a little bit more of an issue and so but the Americans are moving up and well the Allies I should say because there were a lot of British involved were moving up and probably they weren't going to stop so the Germans needed to come in and confront them because otherwise you would be confronting them at the German Italian border but had you got that sort of same co-belligerency status Definitely before the um, landings in mainland Italy, and maybe even before the landings in um, Sicily, by getting rid of Mussolini. Because you got to remember, Mussolini, unlike Hitler, Mussolini was head of government. The king was the head of state. So... Different governments are set up different ways, but I think the king could have legitimately signed a um, peace agreement with the Allies without, um, shall we say, parliamentary slash fascist support. And so you'd also be, you know, like they did, um, dismissing and presumably at least putting into custody um, Mussolini. Because that's, that's my understanding sort of how he was originally arrested. It wasn't like 
so much I, again i don't know is he was just you know it was the fascist grand council that turned on him but they should by that point because he was making disastrous decisions um and um and it was sort of like well if you don't arrest him he's going to go onto the radio and call for you know um a complete fascist revolution against the traitorous government so you've got to you've got to you know um detain him and it, it, and they moved him around to what was it two or three times before they moved it to the hilltop thing where Scorzini rescues him from and he's you know emotionally of course not doing well but they're not like locking him up in a in a in a prison cell they're they're putting him under you know house arrest to deal with the you know the change in government and and whatnot i don't know if there was plans for war crimes trials or any anything like that for for mussolini got to remember a lot not all but a lot of the war crimes that happened in Italy happened um, sort of in the German occupied, occupation period. And a lot of the harsh measures that Mussolini had done, you know, Mussolini was sort of popular in America with the American Italians. They weren't necessarily fascist. They weren't trying to, you know, do a lot of that stuff. But he was, you know, the, Amer the Italians sort of liked the strongman idea like, like Mussolini. But there was one group of American Italians that didn't like him, the mob, the mafia, because a lot of them were, were sort of Sicilians and, Napole, you know, Nepalese from the south down here. And these guys, um, well, Mussolini, if I'm not mistaken, is from a bit more in the north. Um, these guys don't necessarily like the northern types, but also, um, you know, they're the corrupt criminal aspects. And we could go into a lot of it. A lot of this goes into the culture that this was... The Bourbon monarchies um, down here, and that at that time sort of um, Spanish Bourbon monarchies, but in, in before that, it was at times direct ruled by Spain. So it was sort of foreigners ruling over Italians. Italian, you know, locals don't respect, you know, foreigners' laws, so they do things outside of the law. So people acting outside of the law become acceptable. So organized crime becomes acceptable so this is why there's a lot of organized crime particularly in southern italy because of, now there's also occupations in the north and other places too but that's a different story and didn't seem to create a um, mafia type organization so you have these mafias down here and of course a fair number of you know if you know anything about the history of the bootleg and all this they they come over to America and then also just a southern mostly southern Italians. Part of the reason a lot of the southern Italians are coming to America is because this area is um, fairly poor, um, and even in the early industrialization eras, you know, in the mid nineteenth century, again sort of early, um, it's mostly happening up here in the north. So this is sort of a bit more wealthy. So that's why a lot of the um, immigrants, at least my understanding is, um, and I don't have demographic um, information, but just from various movies and things, they all seem to be coming from either like Naples or Sicily or somewhere down here in the south, or a, gr a great number of them are. So from the Italian perspective, they sort of like a lot of the, the immigrants like Mussolini, but the mob doesn't because the Mussolini wants to clean he's a Mussolini is you know the state nothing above the state everything for the state he's a statist and an organized crime group is against the state so he's against the mob now the numbers that I have and again I obviously they're going to give you a range of numbers they're obviously not correct and depends on how you want to do it but during the sort of Mussolini regime the deaths attributed to the regime are somewhere like in the three to six hundred range. You know, now you're comparing that to six to twelve million in the the Holocaust. You know, I'm talking sort of political Holocaust deaths, not people dying in the war because of actions of Mussolini. And obviously, that doesn't count um, what's going on in Ethiopia. Might not count what's going on in other places. But we're sort of talking Italy somewhat political type murders but a lot of these murders or killings changing the word there are dealing with the mafia and they're locking and as well as a lot of the detention camps are dealing with the mafia because so they're not even trying the people because you sort of know who the mob guys are they're just locking them up 
and um, there's some documentaries I've seen is the U.S. specifically sent in mob types to free the people from the camps to then sort of take over Sicily and sort of run this run Sicily while the Allies were, were you know, um, coming over. So the Allies didn't have to set up their own local governments to deal with it. And of course, so they are ending up putting the mob back in power, which still has ramifications to this day. Mussolini was really getting getting that under control. So that's why, because these mob peoples had ties to the American mob peoples, so the mob really didn't like Mussolini because the mob was, um, well, you know, whisper, you know, you know the the you know sending in northern fascist police type guys, just whisper in my ear who the fas or who the who the um, you know the the mob is, you know who the the, um, the mafia is guy is and you just whisper it and they do it and then they go arrest the guy now of course you could have they could have been the the mafia guy whispering against a different wa mafia guy you know i mean it's not you know like it's um solid information that would stand up in court it's just they sort of figured out who the bad guys were and i think more than not they were right but obviously what is as someone i read a while ago the justice system isn't there to punish the guilty the justice system is there is the reason, you, the reason you have a justice system is there is to keep the innocent from being pub, punished. You can always go out and arrest people and, and get, get the bad guys. That, that ain't hard. You don't need a justice system to go get the bad guys. You need a police force. That's different than a justice system. But the justice system is to protect the non-bad guys. You can always get the bad guys and always just, you know, the police can drive around and shoot people who they think are the bad guys and you'll probably get the bad guys I mean, you also may get as many or more good guys or non bad guys or however you want to describe it so that's why you have a justice system so it was outside of the sort of general justice system I'm not saying they didn't have trials I know they did and whatever else but they were just locking people up so so to get back to 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 Atala Balbo dying okay so Tobruk Got a picture of this. I, I hadn't really so much remember hearing that it was from a light cruiser. I knew it was anti-aircraft fire. But whether it's from a light cruiser or from ground-based anti-aircraft fire or, or you know, land-based, it wouldn't be so hard to have a few fascist agents to know that he's scheduled to come in. But are you really reasonably, reliably going to have um, them walk up to an anti-aircraft gun crew? Could be on a ship. Could be, uh, and and generally speaking, he was popular. He wasn't a, um, you know, like a Himmler figure or, or something that, yeah, we wouldn't mind seeing, you know, the the old the elite establishment, we wouldn't mind seeing that guy go because he's the, the bad one. No, he was fairly popular. So, so you know, it's not like oh, the Navy's glad he's dead or anything like that. You know, as a general consensus, to my understanding. And so, are you going to walk up to an anti-aircraft gun battery? You see that plane up there? Shoot that plane down. Make sure you shoot that plane down. But sir, it's a um, an Italian plane. We can see the you know the three fascisti symbols on the underside of the wing. No, no, I am you know whatever um, uh, PNF uh, black shirt leader. You follow my orders. You shoot them down. Yes, sir. Bop 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 bop. Me push. Okay. One. How often do they miss? aircraft coming in um so whether you they you know but even if they do successfully shoot him down how are you going to keep those guys silent now maybe that is why people talk about because maybe just maybe that's why the people talk about this stuff but they never give that kind of details it's just like maybe Mussolini had him shot down I just think the method is now had the aircraft say blown up in air maybe Mussolini had a bomb put on board that's um you know how some like um i think it was tote no it was an aircraft airplane crash or maybe it was a different one that some attempted an assassination at hitler they put a bomb on board and um got somebody else i don't know if it was you know dr fritz tote or somebody else died in it or something like that because i know fritz tote died coming back from the east front I think visiting Hitler, but like they change who was flying when or something like that, and that, and so that may have been a bomb on board or something like that. So yeah, putting a bomb on board, you know, timer or altitude bomb or I don't know, whatever. That 
I would put a lot more credence by, you know, to have a plane just mysteriously blown up. Oh, must have been a, you know, enemy attack or ground fire or something. But that's why I think it, I think it's unlikely. That's, I guess that's my long way around it. Going unlikely, so. He was a great man, so we'll lose um, him in a couple different instances. Or finally. Air organization. Well, this is shorter effects, much shorter effects. Well, we gain more popularity, but okay. Shorter effects, but we'll do that. Well, that's at least my understanding of the analysis of the situation. Okay, they're coming back to there. They're still attacking over there. Good. They're counterattacking. You stop the attack. Then can you advance forward 54 hours? Looks like we'll be able to hold that, so let's send you there. You keep going to occupy that. Everybody's attacking, yes, good. Gotta get through there. Bust on through. Keep going, Germany, keep going. Why hasn't Belgium surrendered? I want to take all these Belgian army units off the front. Switch over to there now. Keep moving, keep being nimble. So you're doing good, you're doing okay, it looks like. About ready to exhaust their good foreign legion guys.
through it there across the psalm there. Moving along the coast, flanking them out. Okay, we have one there. Nanjing Massacre, okay. Stupid move by the Japanese. And it was not just a, you know, an evil bad move, it was a stupid move. Um, destructions of armies are an interesting thing. Most armies aren't destroyed on the battlefield, historically speaking. They're destroyed retreating from the battlefield once they've lost the battlefield in the pursuit afterwards. Now, that sort of murder fest that they did at, at Nanjing um, went on for days. They, they different measures were during part. I mean, they, I mean, they were killing women and children too. Um, so it wasn't just like um, trying to hunt down soldiers. Part of it, though, was trying to separate the soldiers from the civilian population. Um, but that still doesn't justify it. That just explains part of why they were doing it. Um, I think it goes back to some of the wacky samurai eth 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 ethos, ethos. Um, some of it goes to it was sort of a hard fight. You sort of you know, you get these, your, your soldiers are worked up and emotional and mad. And you sort of set, set them loose, sacking the city. So it sort of works it out on them and other sorts of things like that. There's reasons for for it, but they could have controlled it. The Japanese troops weren't. Japanese troops are very, very disciplined. Unless you specifically tell them to go crazy like that, um, they're not going to. Now, it might be a bit more difficult in the midst of that to get large numbers of them back in line. I could, I could imagine that, but um, again, it doesn't make it right. Doesn't justify it. Um, I'm not even really trying to explain good reasons for it. But I do believe part of it was trying, you know, the Jap the Chinese soldiers were like, oh, we've lost. Okay, I'm taking off my uniform, putting on, you know, peasant uniform or, you know, peasant clothing, and I'm melting away into the population. Maybe they were going to desert and go, hell, this war is stupid. Um, you know, we're losing. I just want to, you know, go back because a lot of, a lot of Chinese soldiers were drafted into the army. You can talk about that kind of stuff and... Even before, they continued to be during the war, but, um, you know, all through the war. But a lot of times the way they were drafted and sent because the warlords wanted to, and I'm using the term as such, even though that they were now nationalist generals, a lot of them were still sort of warlords. They had accepted the idea of a central government. They had met largely, excuse me, accepted the idea that Chiang Kai-shek was head of that central central government. But a lot of their political power was based upon their military units. And their military units were often valuable thanks to them. And so they were going to keep them. And this is like before the war even breaks out with, um, that's why I'm saying this, before the war even breaks out with um, Japan. I'm going to keep my good units, my well-equipped troops, my well-trained troops, my reasonably motivated troops in my province, my region, my whatever. You know, the different ma cliques and, um, you know, the various different... Um, large sections and I know we have a few um, mostly I think from Taiwan uh, viewers here but um, and they know this better than I do but even if you're talking about some of these larger click regions even within that you're talking you know different generals had different statuses you don't want to give up your your troops and your command um, and, oh and there were also two military um, uh, one starts with a W, um, and one starts with an H, and I don't know if I would pronounce them correctly, even if I had them written in front of me. Um, two different military academies, and they were rival academies, and we, even within the sort of mainline nationalist army, if you will, um, they would promote people from their own academy over maybe the better candidates, and this was um, the... Um, uh, tax collectors had um, their own army or their, they was part of the nationalist army. They all wore nationalist uniforms. This is why, you know, I know some of the people, the Civil War was largely over by 1936 and 
some people have criticized some of my statements when I've they like some of the stuff I say about China, but then get into some other ranges and they start criticizing me. Um, and as you can tell, I don't know in detail a lot of what I'm talking about, but I know sort of generally what I'm talking about. And it maybe just whether it's their sort of emotions behind it or whether it's just the way they've been taught and see it, or maybe it's just the way down to definitions. Like I'm saying they're warlords. They're going, no, it's China's unified now. It's not this, you know, because they rant and rave about these sort of separate countries. Well, sort of a way to um, to show that there isn't centralized control. So if this country here isn't at war yet with Japan or something, their troops aren't going up here. Their troops are staying down here. And this is sort of a me uh, mechanics functions of, um, you know, Hearts of Iron that the, you don't have the interior organization. So I, I totally agree with using this kind of stuff. That's where often I get in trouble with the people with China, though other elements that I point out, other historical facts about, um, you know, Manchukuo and other things, they're like, yeah, 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 lots of thumbs up from the same people that then get pissed off at some of the other things I say. But, um, so the, the tax um, collectors had their own army, and like in multiple division strengths, and basically what this army was, was a, um, uh, a transport army or a um, you know guard army or whatever so that you collect taxes from some region whether that those troops were involved in collecting taxes I don't think so that's not my understanding but they would come up and show up and collect the money and then make sure it gets to the capital what they collect in in incomplete you know so it's not taken by other government officials oh well we need these you know in some other province to, to do something maybe not to go into somebody's pocket though probably to go into somebody's pocket but also, you know, they have government expenses that they, you know, need to use. So they would, you know, waylay it, if you will, you know, take it for their own use. Um, so, um, and this whole, this army, um, within the Nationalist Army, and so, and so the soldiers, I don't know how much they shifted around between units, but probably not too much, but definitely officers not. There's a lot of these guys um, were not part of the, the other two main uh, military academies, the leadership, a lot of them are come out of America, and they're Chinese. There was a program to get um, started. I'm not exactly sure, maybe even before World War One, but to get um, you know obviously elites from China to come to study in U.S. Um, universities, and one of the places they also came to study was um, the Virginia Military Institute, the v um, uh, VMI which is a very prestigious, maybe even better than West Point. Um, now, of course, it has a Southern Confederate history to it, which, of course, um, is unpopular today, you know, to the idea that, like, um, one of the better generals teaching there, though he was not, a, he was a terrible teacher, but one of the better generals was Stonewall Jackson um, at a time. Why he was a terrible teacher? He would read his, he would write out and read his lectures to the students. And if a student had a question about something, you know, raise your yes, what about this? And he'd go back and reread it and then go on. He was a terrible teacher. Students sort of liked him because he was, you know, when not teaching, I think he had a good personality, but um, he was a terrible teacher. Great military genius, terrible teacher. And so, obviously, since it was the Virginia Military Academy, it was, you know, very, very um, pro-Confederate and slaveholding and all that stuff. But still, it has a very good, very strong tradition of um, providing military leaders to the American Armed Forces, which up and through to at least the Vietnam War, that's why within the, mil the United States Army, because a lot, and to this day, a lot of the Army does still come from the South, more so than other regions, um, but a lot of the officers can't still, um, because you could go through the VMI and then straight in as an officer without going through ROTC, which that was going, which I left that, didn't complete, but that was going to be my option, or going through officer's candidate school, which is you go into the army as an, an enlisted man, show, oh, that guy has potential. No, we'll, we'll put him in the, through these classes, and if he goes, great, he'll become a, you know, an officer instead of slowly working their way through sergeants and up and whatnot. Or going through the um, 
you know, West Point is the there. And there's maybe a couple other schools. I don't know, but I know the VMI was one of the schools that you you would graduate from and generally speaking you go straight in the army as an officer that you're preparing for. It. So this up and through um, you know, like I say, Vietnam, you'll find certain units from the South and others, you know, flying Confederate flags in the army. Now, sometimes they were sort of meaning it as sort of racist, um, you know, kind of things. Other times it was just, hey, these are our, you know, this was my great grandfather's battle flag type, you know, not the actual flag, but the Confederate flag. And we're with a Georgia unit or a Texas unit or whatever. And, you know, uh, and again, in the South, and you can see some of the stuff that deals with, you know, the, um, uh, um, the Black Flying Squadron, you know, and some of the racist stuff. There were a lot of racists, but it, but that's just really more of an indicative of what people were like at the time. But as time goes on, that becomes, and, and he's on an individual, it's um, more or less important. But even when it, it wasn't so much even flying, especially like through the Civil War, because it's before the Civil Rights Movement, it was more of just a regional flag within the, um, Civil War, and so this is why you find, um, like our current Secretary of Defense, um, Mattis, Mad Dog Mattis, going, yeah, yeah, you know, um, Jackson and Lee were, were really good guys, because he's, they one, they're viewing history, in my opinion, correctly through the lens of the period, and two, their, their information of them as are as military leaders, and that's the way, whether they've gone through these institutions or go through West Point, they study Jackson and Lee very much so as military leaders, and so that continues to form um, U.S. military thought. Now, like I was saying, there was a lot of Chinese going through through here. Eh, a lot, eh, a trickle, but um, there were uh, a, a number of them. And these, um, and especially more of them switched over to military education um, as the war was heating up with um, Japan and they were coming back to um, China and they were very much discriminated against amongst within the army because they didn't go through either of the two main military I want to say like Wow Peng and Hung Nang or I'm again I'm butchering them. I'm sorry anyone who knows it but the, the other two military academies again I sort of know this in broad strokes so don't know this in detail um, but they were being um, discriminated against. But the, at some point, the people putting together the, the tax army, if you will, were some of these American trained. Now, again, these are, at least for the great part, these are not Chinese Americans. I read some stories about some Chinese Americans, particularly one woman who was traveling around China. And the Chinese were fascinated by this foreigner. Because although she spoke some Chinese... She was not a Chinese. She was an American. Now, she sort of, you know, ethnically looked like him, but her hair was different. Her her clothing was different, and she was clearly not a Chinese because she was had grown up and raised, you know. It was, she, this was her and her Chinese, Amer, you know, American Chinese husband and some, you know, white Americans were traveling, you know, in the sort of, you know, I don't know, in sort of, you know, the outback, if you will, of, of China and whatnot. And so these were sort of, Foreigners, you know, some of them were were European American, some of them were Chinese American. I'm not talking, and they weren't they weren't that. They weren't the Chinese Americanized Chinese. These were fully Chinese type people, ra born raised in China that had gone through like university education in America. Well, in doing so, they come they come out with American accents, and so a few of these guys sort of get in charge or get in key positions in the the tax army. So the tax army gets most of the Chinese American trained officers and supposedly these guys were pretty good and if you get through vmi, VMI um virginia military institute um you're a good officer you get through that you're a good officer from everyone i've heard from because also some of those guys go into the marine corps from some of the marines i've talked to the ncos who have a very low opinion of of their marine officers because i've known some ncos have very low opinion of their officers um, one, he said, I had two only, I only knew two good officers in my entire time. And he was like in for eight or more years as an active and then reserve, um, NCO. One of them was, uh, a Naval Institute graduate, 
you know, that he went through the, you know, um, Annapolis. And the other one was a VMI graduate that instead of going in the army, he, you know, after the VMI go, went into the the Navy, or, or yeah, the, the Marines. So, so all the feedback is, as I get from them, are they're very good officers. So these guys are in here; they're very good. So they do really good training. And sort of the, the thing is, is some of the the units that were sent by Chiang Kai-shek later on to sort of defend the Burma Road on this end, and then had to once the Japanese approached and it was being cut off, had to retreat into Burma. Um, they were some of the tax armies. So once, you know, they sort of, the units made it out into um, India and were being reorganized, or, you know, initially being reorganized by the British, sort of confusing the British because there would be, you know, they, um, a, a Chinese, you know, a Chinese officer would walk up to them and and um, speak to them in an, a an accent that was sort of funny for them because they were speaking in, in, a, in a Southern American accent, not in a Chinese accented way, but in a Southern American accent. So it was a bit confusing to them. Who's this American sounding person um, talking to them in a Chinese uniform? But so um, there's all these factions going on is the point within the Chinese army. Um, and so I know this. So I know these different warlords that sort of accepted the overall system were still very much controlling, to get back to the point of this, controlling their regions. Well, the central government, Chiang Kai-shek, would order things to be done, and this is also part of what I know is going on. And, um, you know, if he ordered uh, some of the divisions, you know, the key good divisions out of a, um, from one warlord's area, you know, over here, oh, come up over here. Oh, sure, yes, sir, yes, sir, as soon as we can, sir, kind of thing. Oh. Well, the trucks broke down. Oh, we're we're trying to get food. We haven't we don't have any fuel. Can you send us some fuel? Um, we're you know, basically not disobeying the order by saying no, but um, finding excuses and reasons to delay and keep things going on. And the Chinese understood this, but they would also demand um, from the different regions cons conscripts. You know, you're in the army now. And a lot of the conscripts didn't want to be in the army now. And two, they're like, oh, I don't know, from over here or up here or down here or wherever. But they don't want to go to the other side of China. So that they would literally, I mean, because I've seen pictures of them, they would literally like uh, stick a board down their back, wrap rope around them, um, wrap rope, you know, to the board and then sort of, you know, their head up so that they couldn't look down, you know, to this board and then tie their hands behind, um, behind them in, in multiple, you know, sort of like in a bondage situation and then string a bunch of these guys together and that, and they would keep them for days, weeks, whatever time as they traveled, you know, maybe on river boats and trains, but also walking to, to induction centers and they were walked across China this way. Um, so you'd have to hand feed them and, you know, by recruiting soldiers that would get to go back home. And that's how the, a lot of these guys were sent into sort of centrally controlled nationalist army units. Now, once you're the other, ha the other side of China and you're given a uniform and you no longer speak the local, well, whether it's language, because Cantonese is different than, than Mandarin or whether it's just the local dialects or the local accents, you now sort of stand out. And, hey, maybe this army isn't that bad. After all, they're feeding me. I'm wearing some clothes. Maybe I don't have a weapon yet, but then it's maybe peacetime. So, you know, I got a bamboo spear or something and I'm being trained. So, you know, they don't, you know, there's desertion, I'm sure, but may not be super high um, levels of desertion. So you have these people that are very reluctant. Now, once you've lost your capital, once you've lost the battle, and the, that maybe a lot of these guys, this army life ain't for me anymore. I want to get back home, wherever home is. And so they're done with the war. Others, I think, were very patriotic. And it's, this is not a slam on China. Others, I think, were very patriotic, but took off their uniforms to try to melt back in the population, either with the general idea and there was definitely some people ordered to be guerrilla type leaders to be guerrilla leaders or 
you know, to link up and be resist, you know, guerrilla resistance, or to slowly filter back to wherever China, Chinese controlled territory to join up with new units. So the Japanese were sort of trying to so sort these out. And there's definite real evidence that they were trying to sort people out. But then they were also doing murder parties too. You know, oh, line all those women up there and let's cut their heads off with samurai swords to, to get better at cutting heads off with samurai swords. I mean, that's just sort of the sport that the officers were doing. And of course, none of those women would look even vaguely like being soldier women, you know, or anything. They weren't like fit women. They were just women in their 30s that they had rounded up and had probably been raped a bunch of times. So let's cut their heads off. So it's, you know, and it's probably going to get my episode demonetized, but whatever. And so this was a murder party. But so we're talking about armies taking more, uh, being destroyed and their retreats. Well, it's one thing when, guy, when soldiers are running away, you shoot them in the back. Because that doesn't mean they've surrendered. That doesn't mean they've given up the war. They're just trying to get the hell out of there as fast as they can. Now, maybe they decided, like I said, the war is no longer for them. And if they can, they're going to go home. But so long as they're running, so long as you're, they're not in their cu your custody, you get to shoot them. But once they're in your custody, once they're no longer fighting, once you're going through the town, going through the city, and rounding people up, and finding people that you believe are soldiers, you, and they're in your custody, you don't get to shoot them because they're not actively running away. They're not actively shooting at you. Now, I, you know, I'm sure really good NCOs and really good officers are valuable, and I'm sure a few really good, um, if there were privates that had skills that weren't NCOs or officers, you know, radio operators or, I don't know, artillerymen who could figure out how to properly shoot an artillery piece, not just point it in the direction of the enemy and pull the trigger, but, you know, do this sort of some calculations and actually hit a target indirectly. Yeah, but that's not the main group of people. So manpower isn't really the main issue for um, China. So killing them in large batches isn't the problem. They really should have just rounded up large groups of military age males and try to interview them and sort them out. Not then kill the soldiers, put the soldiers in prisoner of war camps. Hey, what an idea. And um, those that either they figure they aren't soldiers or don't think they're soldiers, or if they're, eh, these guys may be soldiers, but they don't hardly know, you know, you know, uh, and it's, it's hard to interview because they're going to play dumb, of course, but, you know, figure out what not and let them go and, you know, if we see them again, we'll we'll shoot them on the battlefield. That would have been a better um, solution to do this situation because several reasons. Um, let's take the sort of obvious Western reason first is the Nanjing Massacre is a um, serious black eye on Japan. And it takes it from being, oh, Chinese troops shot at our our troops at the Marco Polo Bridge, and China's just in chaos, so we've got to put a new order and try to get things reasonably done in China totally out the window. Because that's sort of the, the story, at least is my understanding, the story to the outside world is what was going on with China. It was, oh, we need to reestablish order. It wasn't um, the story of well, maybe part of that is defeating communism, but it isn't. We're trying to install our, our ideology on China, like, say, the fascists may be trying to install their ideology onto Spain, you know, and you know, Italian fascists and that kind of thing. It's to establish order for the benefit of the Chinese to have a properly ordered society and all that kind of stuff. So it sort of blows out the humanitarian sort of viewpoint. Two, um, so our second, it makes people upset in China. You know, so your, your goodwill with the rest of the world shot, but internally it makes people upset with them. Now, if you have a conqueror that, you, that everyone perceives as afraid to um, do something violent, people aren't going to respect the law. Yeah, but you also have the situation where um, 
if the people have no choice, um, you know, if you have a Death Star and they're going around blowing up planets, and you think your planet is on the neck or is going to be on the list, well, you have no choice but to join the rebellion because it's oh, they're going to kill all of us. It's not like they're coming to occupy us and only get the bad guys. They're coming to kill all of us. So it gets to sort of the point that you no longer appear to have a choice. You, you know, it's um, we're just going to kill everybody kind of thing, no matter what, you know. So so resistance, just even if it's futile, it's, you know, it, it, it's going to drive a lot of people to fight or to resist or to be uncooperative. Where if you had taken prisoners, legitimate prisoners of war, well, now, you know, if you can find out who their families are and go, hey, you know, and notification, your son is captured by us just notifying you. And, you know, he's now, you know, in a prisoner of war camp. And, of course, Japan wasn't assigned a treaty to the, you know, League of Nations prisoner of war accord. So you probably end up being a work camp and a labor camp. I don't know. Um, if your province and everything, you know, and you, with, with the sort of implied threat that if your province and everything is nice and peaceful your son will be, you know, um, just fine kind of thing and that sort of stuff. So you you give them sort of a reason to um, not cause trouble with that. And um, I guess those are the two main points. I could try to divide the, the second point up into more things. But that's sort of what happens with... Um, Germany and France. All of the French army that's captured by the Germans, either in the initial invasion or, uh, you know, all these, you know, things, or sort of when Germany immediately comes in and demobilizes, you know, um, units here, you know, oh, they've surrendered, okay, all, you know, this battalion or this division, okay, everybody line up here, you're coming into captivity, you know, drop your rifles, take off your helmet. Take off your, you know, your, your web gear with your ammo and all that kind of stuff. And you get to keep your backpack with, you know, your your underwear and your toiletries and whatever. But but everybody, you know, line up and come. Germany kept all those people in prison camps because they were prisoners of war. They, at least for the most part, um, didn't let those people out. French tried to get them out, the Vichy French, uh, for different reasons and different things. But for the most part, they didn't allow those people out. Now, they let the Vichy recruit new soldiers to be in Vichy operations, you know, um, whether guarding France or guarding the colonies. But they wouldn't let, e and even, and again, I say generally, because I maybe you can find it, I'm not sure, whether if some some individuals or officers were known to be um, members of the various fascist-type political parties, they might have gotten out. Um, you know, so those that would, you know, had a pre-war pre history of you know, being involved in some of that. I don't know, really, just don't know in detail. I can't remember if I've read some of that, that they were or not. But for the most part, they were kept in prisoner of war camps. But with the understanding of, hey, well, someday you'll get Paris back and you'll have um, France back. Okay, the borders will be changed. You know, maybe some of it's, you know, down here and um, Nice is going to be Italian maybe and you know a few things like that and um, you're going to get your country back and you're going to get your prisoners of war back when all this is over with you know initially it was you know with Britain and so so there's a reason to not stab a German soldier in the back in Paris when he's on you know um, you know leave in Paris or um to have a French policeman who early on a bit more so um, were actually helping to suppress some of the, at least um, because again, some of the, um, you know, so, some of the, the um, resistance people, they weren't really looking for it. And as, especially as the war goes on and Vichy's occupied, the police stop really uh, reliably um, looking for resistors, but are still looking for criminals. You know, those that um, you would really define as criminals. Trying to maintain public order within society. And so um, you have, you know, but to try to keep those people 
operating because, hey, you know, sometime you're going to get your country back. Just hang on. Follow orders. You'll do that. So that way you have Vichy border guards, you know, or just, or even occupied French people, you know, um, police officers and other people continuing to function because you're going to get your country back. Well, if you had that sort of situation in China was, is, hey, you know, the borders are going to change, but we're setting up this reorganized state of China and all these Chinese prisoners of war. Who wants to join this new army kind of thing? Oh, and we didn't cut off all your heads when we captured you because we're, you know, we're not nice guys, but we're not really the monsters they call us kind of thing. This is getting back to China. And so the idea that, you know, once you get things a bit more established and set up, once you get um, politics, politicians and of course they're not going to be popularly elected politicians but they're political types and you're going to get government administrator types that are starting to function for this new collaborationist government you're more likely to have other people go eh, this collaborationist government ain't good but it would but it's better than having continued war in china if you will that is, again, why, and that sort of goes to the second point there, of why it was a mistake to butcher large groups of people. Enter the Soviet Union and the Katen Forest, since we're talking war crimes here. Katyen, Katen, um, uh, somewhere here in... I don't know if it's even on this map, but... Um, basically, the great bulk of the... Um, Polish armies in the West, and it is um, captured by the German army. Um, obviously, there were Polish units on the um, Soviet border, but they were minimal in border guards. Well, as part of the Ribbentrop Molotov and the pack, basically half of the army that's captured, that Germany captures, Germany gives to the Soviet Union. The Soviet wants them. The Soviet Union wants them. They specifically asked for them. And um, and basically, I think the great majority, 90 plus percent of these people, as well as um, other peoples that are not socialistly mined or, or socialistly um, thought process or whatever you want to call it in Poland, are sent off to gulags to do work. But all of the officers, and in the hundreds, I some can look it up and whatever, um, that are turned over, the Soviets take them out to the forest and shoot them all, and just sort of leave them in the forest. Because these are the thought leaders, if you will, against socialism, because the conservative, the army was, the Polish army was generally a conservative organization, and it was also a nationalistic organization, so even if they're not um, hooray for capitalism or hooray for um, private ownership of land, even if it's not capitalistic or whatever, you know, elites and whatever, they're probably not going to be hooray for Soviet occupation, even if they may be a socialist in the officer corps. I don't know in detail. So they're all shot. The Germans don't shoot their officer, the captured officers. They they work them. I don't know whether to death or they're not treated well, but they're, they're, they're used in labor camps. Now, of course, once the, the Germans invade um, this and find the um, Katyen Forest Massacre, they publicize it. Um, Roosevelt refused to believe that it's true. I, Roosevelt, like Wilson before him, has a um, soft spot for communists. He believes Roosevelt or Wilson more of is supporting of communism. FDR is more that um, that you know um, we need to go the slow path towards communism someday. You know, maybe two hundred years from now, but someday man will evolve into a socialist mindset, and that's basically his communist mindset. You know, under Marx, and so he, you know, and Stalin and these revolutionaries are just a little too headstrong and a little too, you know, um, overreacting to things. But he, they really kind of think that they're the good guys. So um, FDR refuses to believe it's true. 
um, and that it's just German propaganda. But for once, it wasn't German propaganda and all the horrors that Germany was exposing. Of course, Germany was at that time, you know, are, you know, doing other death camps too. But um, they sort of show up that um, uh, um, show up that the Soviets were doing this too. And when um, either Stalin or Molotov or one of them was asked by I think it was a British diplomat or somebody involved. Well, where are the um, Polish officers? Because the Poles that are in all these um, gulags, once the war gets started, the Soviets wanted to put them into the you know the war effort. Hey, now we got to fight the Nazis to free your country. Well, basically all of them say go to hell, and um, they refuse to fight for the Soviets. And because there's because the because the British war reason for the war. The British reason and the French reason for the war is to defend Poland. I mean, that's why they go into the wars to defend Poland. And there's all these Polish prisoners. So the Soviets allow, allow don't help, but allow all these Poles to leave. But the Poles notice, oh, well, where are the officers? And of course, in the gulags, they just think that they've been separated from their officers. Um, and so they literally walking. I mean, they may take the train, some of the some of the train things, but they literally walk down, walk into Iran, um, walk across Iran, and somewhere in British territory they start getting train rides and whatever. And so it's it's a core or more um, or more worth, including a lot of children, because um, children are picked up in this. And they have there's a whole I have some photos of um, that you know collected online. Of you know like thirty or forty or more children in Pol you know and you know children's corps for the Pol you know uh, uh, part of the Polish army. Now they're not going to fight, but these are all the sons or whatever that have been scooped up as part of this thing in these gulag camps, and so they've marched out with their fathers um, because it's mostly just men, and uh, there's some women, but mostly just men, and they're all marching out and they sort of they form up here. Well, the word comes out there was a mistake. This was even I think before the Katyn forest um, was. There was a mistake made, or something. Like that. That's about all the Soviets will say um, to the to the Western Allies uh, about where are the Polish officers and intellectuals. Um, there was a mistake made, and that mistake was to butcher them because maybe the world will change, and they would be more useful to you now. You're never going to, of course, because you're an evil communist, you're never going to allow them to go back home and ferment anti-communist thought that you're going to work them slowly to death in the gulag. But it shows you why um, butchering large groups of people like that are a mistake because maybe things will change and it would be better to give a bunch of Poles um, officers to better fight the communists. So, yeah, that's sort of the story of why you don't want to butcher large groups of people, you know, and, uh, you know, I, I'm all, f you know, if we find that all ISIS members are all murderers and whatever, then okay. You know, I mean, if we go through a judicial kind of situation and, you know, it's sort of like the SS, you know, if you're a prison camp guard, maybe every, you know, should you be in prison for life or should you be executed just because you're, you know, a, a death camp guard? I'm, you know, we can talk about other elements of the SS, but we're talking, I'm talking right now about people that we could identify as simply, simply their job was to guard people that are being fed into death machines. Yes, I think they could all deserve death. Uh, I, I, I would, if I was on their jury, I would vote them all dead. So, um, so yes, yeah. so, so, in my opinion, the trial uh, for a prison, an SS prison camp guard is, can we prove that you were a guard, or you know, or somebody functioning at as part of that system in that camp? You can say Dachau. Now they also uh, elements of the camp that were Alaric, um, uh porcelain. That they, to the best of my understanding, they didn't have death or, or inmates working on it. Those were outside artisans that were, because the SS bought this old um, uh, porcelain company that made really high, Alaric, Alaric, something however, 
high-end porcelain. Now they also did sort of SSC things, but they continue to do a lot of you know traditional German porcelain stuff. I don't know if the company still exists, but the SS bought it, and they moved it as part of um, the location as part of the Greater Dachau camp, but not part of the um, prison camp and not part of the or death camp. Uh, and not part of um, you know some of the other things, but just sort of as part of the greater facility thing there. And to my best understanding, is they didn't use um, forced labor in that. I, I may be wrong. Uh, this is not saying oh it's good, but so that but and then when they bought the com company out, they included all you know oh you work there well you're going to continue working at the you know. Who wants to quit the SS company and stay in Germany? You know, if you know what I mean. It's sort of, you get that sort of um, situation. Why is Germany sitting motorized units back here guarding? Uh, talk about why I like the idea of internal security, you know, um, uh, not internal security, but um, in-depth security, multiple layers, and that there's a lot of units back home that are... Um, sort of like this that you know if there's other sort of invasion they're not all up at the front but why do you have nice motorized units there and i was also wondering why these guys are sitting here not moving to the protect the border in the front well they're getting these guys right they're putting you know the totenkopf death camp type guys up to guard and reduce um, revolt risk but don't know so um And then there was also other training facilities at Dachau. So maybe if they were only involved in some of those non-death camp, prison camp, whatever, Dachau thing, maybe not. But if we can prove that you worked as part of the death camp, prison camp, that's all. Uh, and then I'll, you go, yep, but you get to die. You know, you don't have to prove that they actually shot somebody or they pulled the lever or whatever. Nope, just you were an SS guy, you worked at the camp, you get to die. And so... Now, I'm not going to go there this time to, what about everybody who was in the SS? Should they all, I'm, I'm just talking because this is being clear. So if you find a group of people, if it's, if you go that ISIS, eh, if you're a member of ISIS, you had to be actively supporting a um, criminal organization that is committing war crimes, mass butchery, and other things. So if we find you and prove that you're ISIS, we get to kill you. And then, okay, but see, there's still that. We prove that you're a member of the ISIS, not just, oh, that guy, he speaks Arabic, has a beard, he must be ISIS. No, no, not saying that. Um, I'm saying maybe if you have a tattoo on you that says ISIS, you know, I joined ISIS or something. Yeah, okay, yeah, that's sort of proof. You know, put that in front of a quickie jury and go, yeah, okay, yeah, you know, you only get the, the you know, I heart ISIS tattoo if you're in the middle of ISIS or something. Um, so, you know, if we go through a, a, a thing, but if we go find, well, they're all ISIS fighters, but not all are war criminals, and we got to sort them out, then I'm all for sorting them out. But also with this sort of thing is I am an anti-Islamic, fundamentalist, radicalist, whatever you want to call ISIS, um, Al-Qaeda, other types of extremist Islam. And yes, I know I've got even a... I hope you're doing well, um, viewer in Iran who who posted, chatted back a little bit a while ago because Iran's going through turmoil as I'm making this. But and I know I get views from other parts of Saudi Arabia and other Arab states. It's not anti-Muslim or anti-Arab. I'm talking about the extremist radicals, but even the extremist radicals who have not committed violence, and which includes a lot of imams and other people, because I'm anti those people. I don't think they should be killed just because you you have these viewpoints. But I think we ought to create um, radical Islam island for you or some, some sort of place like that. I don't know, is Bahrain a good place to do that? Or Qatar or um, well, Socotra has those really cool trees. But um, create, you know, is it part of Madagascar? Create a sort of um, contained colony so that you can peacefully live the rest of your life out and, pra and maintain your extremist, you know, maybe part of Sinai Peninsula or somewhere that you can continue to live and we'll make sure you have enough food and you can, you know, build housing and, and live your um, fundamentalist Islamic life out in a, you know, controlled environment so that you don't get to 
suicide bomb the rest of the world. And so if you want to be a suicide bomber, you can blow yourself up amongst other radicals. Now, if you, you leave the area, you know, you can have, you know, um, fences that, you know, you know, you know, sort of like, sort of like a prison camp. You know, if you try, try to go over the wire, we get to shoot you. You come too close to a tower, we get to shoot you. So you have, some, you have a suicide bomb or suicide knife or something. Because, you know, if you're giving them fertilizer to grow food, they can try to create bombs, you know, fertilizer bombs or something like that. So, so you know, if you're getting creative and you're, you're inside your community, you're creating bombs. We get to shoot you as you come too, too near the fence. And that kind of thing. But, you know, and this could be a fairly largish place and you can have Islamic fundamentalist world and you just contain it. That's that's sort of my solution because I don't know if they're ever going to sign a peace treaty and, and give up being suicide bombers. And the mullahs, whether directly or indirectly, and it's not all of them. I don't even know if it's most of them. But hey, if you got 10% of the mullahs in the Islamic world, that's a hell of a lot of people. Okay, because the Islamic world is big. But the mullahs that give public praise and others support, you know, from their church for suicide bombers, even though they, you know, don't do it or don't actively, you know, go go talk to Joe over there. He'll hook you up with a bomb vest. No, I'm just talking that, that give praise to it. We got to lock these people up because they're push. It's, it's like, they're you know, they're organized. They're, they're spreading this philosophy of, Of doing violence in 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 Muhammad's name. Now, if they were just fundamentalists and say, "Hey, you, you should all go be fundamentalists," and but leave everybody else alone. If your neighbor is not a fundamentalist, don't talk to him because he has bad ideas. But just leave him alone. Don't bother him. I mean, if that was if that was the fundamentalist message, and so they were spreading it through mosques or wherever, you know, and welcome everybody to listen to my message. But um, we don't want to hear non-fundamentalist talk here because we're fundamentalists. And ye who are a fundamentalist and going to live the right way of God. Now, of course, I guess their right way of God is to go commit violence in God's name to spread the faith. But, you know, but if their message was, well, if your neighbor, literally, phys physically your neighbor or just somebody else in the world or whatever, is a sinner... Leave him alone. Don't talk to him because maybe he'll give you bad ideas. Don't don't talk to him. And if your children take a bad path, well, sorry, they're not going to get to heaven. You you did your best. Don't kill them. Don't do honor killings. I think honor killings aren't maybe so much Muslim, but um, cultural to various regions. Um, I don't know. Um, and yes, I, you can correct me. I know this is becoming a bit of a rant video now, but um, that, you know, if it just, you know, it's sort of like um, we have both the um, the Amish and the Quakers. They're both pacifist organizations. They're both fundamentalist Christian organizations. Um, one of them is sort of famously um, the, the Amish, you know, when you, I don't know, turn 18, turn 21 or whatever. Go have a year or two of living in the outside world and then choose between um, living in the outside world or living our path. And then, you know, if you choose our path, you've got to follow our path. And we're going to shame you and we're going to do, you know, all kinds of things to keep you right on our path, you know, and grow a beard and, you know, live without electricity. And, you know, the now the Quakers, they have, my understanding, they get to have electricity in modern uh, things. They're just a sort of a pacifist fundamentalist sect, but they get to have modern, modern conveniences. Um, but they are very plain speaking, meaning they don't, they don't like, um, they don't like our calendar because our calendar is pagan. You know, for, they like first month, second month, third month, fourth month. They don't, you know, want to do, um, you know, the God Augustus's month, you know, or something like that. Or the God Julius's month, August and July. Um, or you don't like Freya's day, Friday? I mean, you know, it's, you know, so they're, you know, so we have the Quakers, and they're really small, and they, they, they will proselytize, and the Amish don't so much proselytize, I don't think, but and but they're fundamentalists, and if you're going to be part of their community, you got to live their way, but if you don't live, you don't want to live, be part of their community, basically, they'll just turn their backs on you and say, go away, and if my neighbor, you know, is a um, rock and roll westerner who drinks alcohol, okay, I'll just leave him alone, hopefully he'll leave me alone, and we'll just, you know, live, exist in the same world, but without sort of talking to each other. It, 
that is, and these are sort of not, they didn't necessarily start in America. I think they both started in England, but came for refugee status. The Quakers to Pennsylvania and the Amish, um, which I think are more coming out actually Germany or something, um, to wherever they are in the Northeast, you know, more up here, I think. But um, they're, you know, we're different. Stay away. They're all, all the rest of the world is, is, is ungodly and evil, but leave it alone. You know, and, and so their women have to live in their sort of traditions, particularly in the Amish, in their sort of ways that modern women's liberation would think is oppressive. Okay. But they also give you the choice that if you don't want to live their way, get the hell out. Now, of course, you don't get to, you know, come back for Amish Christmas or whatever. You just get the hell out. And so, you know, if that was what Islam, fundamental Islam was doing, I'd be fine with it. Just go do it. You know, even if it was Saudi Arabia, you know, that big. And women can't drive, well, okay, that's stupid, but okay. And, oh, but if you want to leave Saudi Arabia and go away, okay, fine, you know. And there was, you know, like North Saudi Arabia and South Saudi Arabia. One is, you know, fundamentalist and one isn't or something like, you know, I'd be happy with it. But because at least everything I know of all of these fundamentalists, they're all supporting violence to, to, um, in large and small ways, inside and outside of Islamic countries, supporting violence to to spread their version of Islam. That is why I think they should be contained. And yes, I may have an unsubscriber or two, whether you're a um, secularist in the West who don't like my views. Sorry, that's my views. And if you're a... Um, Muslim person, you, you obviously, if you've watched the channel for a while, you know I'm a pro-Western patriot, you know, Western culture. I think Western culture is the best culture. You can think your culture, whether it's Asian culture or um, Middle Eastern culture or Indian culture or whatever culture in the world, you know, Pacific Islander culture is the best in the world. You can think that. Everybody can think their own culture is best if you want. That's not, to me, that's not a, a, um, a you know, some sort of negative thing that you should find people bad for, for liking their culture more than somebody else's. So I'm a pro-Western culture guy, always. Not that everything in, in the Western culture is good or great or I support, no, but it's the best. But I'm not trying to convert everybody to my way of life if they want to go do their own thing. And so, yes, you in the Middle East who watch my videos already sort of know that. And I already sort of know this about me, and I think most of you are somewhat agreeing with me about the Islamic fundamentalist guys in Iran and ISIS and Al Qaeda and you know the Houthi tribes in Yemen that are you know doing stuff. And so you're already sort of agreeing with me at least to some degree. You might not agree with my prescriptions and how to solve it, but that's that kind of thing. So. On that happy note, we're going to end the episode. So if you still want to be around, um, please subscribe to the channel. Thanks for liking the videos. Thanks for watching and putting up with me. And of course, please post comments, questions, suggestions. You can give your different viewpoints if you want to. That's fine. And I'll sort of support mine. But we'll, both our viewpoints can be mentioned below. Doesn't mean you got to agree with me to stay around. And, of course, if you've got corrections, whether it's about Islam or other sorts of parts of the world, if I'm getting you know, um, facts wrong, please educate me. I do want that because if I'm misunderstanding the world, I want to try to understand it better. So thanks so much. See you next time for more Hearts of Iron and a little less preaching. <laughs>